us on the close up. He is the nominee of the GOP and the new leader of the Republican Party. But is the GOP ready to embrace one of the most divisive and polarizing figures in the history of presidential politics? And ready to square off for the corner office in Concord, former Portsmouth Mayor Steve Marchand talks about his strategy and his quest to become the next governor. Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Josh McKelvin. We've all had a few days now to digest the idea of a person who was really counted out uh, the day he entered this race is now the presumptive Republican nominee for the White House. What for many people was unthinkable a year ago, now very much a reality and barring some unlikely scenario, Donald Trump will be the GOP nominee. And without a doubt, he also has a lot of energized voters out there. That can't be denied at this point. Joined now by Mike Dennehy, GOP strategist, Tom Rath, same thing. You started, Mike, with uh, Rick Perry's campaign of late. Uh, Tom, you were with John Kasich. First, and Tom, we'll start with you. Just your overall reaction to, of where we are right now with Donald Trump. Well, I mean, he, he is going to be the nominee. He is going to have uh, uh, the most one of the most unique presidential campaigns I've ever seen in terms of he needs to build structure because it's really been based a lot on who he is and just this kind of almost wildfire that's gone out there. Uh, we keep trying to judge him, I think, by traditional measures of what a campaign ought to look like and how it ought to act right now. And he sort of throws those measures out the window and we are in for a very interesting and I think highly unpredictable uh, next four months. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Tom. We've been judging Donald Trump for a full year now, and he has thrown everything on its head. He didn't run a traditional campaign. He's done everything differently, and he's captured tremendous energy with uh, voters who are frustrated, Republicans and independents. That is clearly uh, the benefit of the Donald Trump candidacy. And now it's really, he, he does have to pull things together on a national scale, and he needs to pull all of those other 16 candidates for Republican uh, that were running for the Republican nomination together. Uh, it's starting to happen. It's going to take some time. But uh, is, is he going to get a shot? Do you believe? I mean, because obviously this was—you say he didn't run a traditional campaign. That mm. kind of understates it. I mean, this, was, <laughs> this, this, this whole thing was nuts True. from some of the things that he was saying. But uh, can he? How, how does he do it? How does he start uh, bridging these gaps that he himself created? Uh, I, I think he starts by getting those candidates together. That's that's really priority number one, so that he can pull the Republican Party together. Uh, once that happens, I'm confident that it will be a good campaign between either he and Hillary or Bernie. I mean, the, the question is who the, who the real nominee is going to be on the Democratic side. But, uh, but I, I think the energy that Donald Trump has going for him is going to be a tremendous asset. And his ability to market uh, his campaign. That has also been something that, that we've never seen before, the way he's been able to, uh, he, he, look, we looked at, we, when he first started, no one believed he'd win, and he did the same thing to those candidates, which, you know, arguably he may do to Hillary Clinton. You got to, and Tom, you pointed this out when we were speaking earlier this week, he deserves some credit here. I mean, because he, uh, aside from winning the nomination, he had to overcome <laughs> everything. Uh, right? I mean, I agree with Mike to a point, but where I don't agree, and I don't know how to even calculate this, is I don't think he can change doing what he's done, and I don't think he's likely to. Mm. Uh, I think he likes dictating the rules. It's like he, he views everything in life as a transaction, as a negotiation, and I think he sees this as the ultimate negotiation, and he comes to the table with his assets, and is he going to compromise those in any way to get the deal? he wants I, I don't think so uh, I, I, I think he cannot the one thing he cannot do is start acting like a normal politician mm -hmm. he cannot say all right I understand it's changed I have a different role now that he cannot do that he's got to play the the, the part he has cast for himself and I have said to you and to others that I have a lot of Democratic friends who are you know doing high-fiving each other uh, Wednesday morning saying this is great you know yeah. Hillary's got a, a cakewalk they they are making a huge mistake if they discount what is out there and the idea that this this ferment this this concern this uh, anger anger mm. that has been manifested itself in the unbelievable support for that candidacy is limited somehow to the Republicans and a few right-wing independents I think it cuts across the border and assuming that we have for the moment that uh, Hillary will be the nominee I think she will be the a lot of what drove the Bernie Sanders support not necessarily among the young people 
people, but among labor unions who felt disaffected with where the National Democratic Party was. All those kinds of people that are unhappy with the way the system has failed to reward them, they're going to be very drawn to this Trump candidacy. You know, I'm not an advocate for it, but I'm saying you better not discount it. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry if I if I said something that, to allude to the fact that Donald Trump shouldn't do what he's been doing. He has to do what he's been right. doing, and I think he knows that. That's what his entire candidacy is built upon. And you know what? The interesting thing is, if, if the Democratic contest wasn't a, as fixed as it would be, Bernie Sanders would probably be the nominee. The energy on, on the left is similar to the energy on the right, and that's going to, as Tom said, uh, uh, that's going to be a problem for the Democrats. There is zero energy for Hillary Clinton, there's zero passion for Hillary Clinton, and that's only going to benefit the Republicans. Let me ask you, the conventional wisdom is that, you know, Donald Trump's going to have to get some of that Republican base over, uh, win, win, win them over in order to beat a Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. We'll see what happens. Do you think that's true or because we talk about him not changing his style? I mean, it, for Republicans, well, you know, the conservatives who, who listen to him say, you know what, I'm going to expand Social Security, do benefits, you know, they, they cringe, but he's bringing in a different sort of no, group. I, I, I think that's a fair comment, Josh. I think in, in many ways uh, he has not run as a traditional Republican. Right. And I don't think he needs to conform himself to, to some sort of mindset. In, in a lot of ways, I know people probably get really angry with me, but he is probably the most moderate on social mm -hmm. issue Republican candidate we've had probably in 20 years at least sure, because yeah. he is open on a lot of these things now it's going to get dramatized because he tends to be so extreme and so arbitrary and so over the top the way he advocates for things but his core philosophy uh, I, I think is is not anathema to a lot of people but I, I think he's going to say you know, forget it I have been running I think Mike would agree with this I've been running as a general election candidate all the way along and the Republican yes. nomination was a necessary step, but he's always had his eyes more on November than he has on July. Yeah, there's no, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. And, and you know, I think the re Republicans, again, it's going to take some time for conservatives, some ideological conservatives who are still not, uh, the last two days, three days, with Trump, it's going to take some time, but that's where the common ground has to come in, whether it's immigration uh, uh, or on fiscal tax policy, um, reforming government, uh, uh, conservative changes. Those are the things that he's going to have to reach out to conservatives and come to agreement on. This is where we'll focus. For the health of the party, how important do you think it was for uh, him to lock up this nomination before the convention? Because everybody thought this was going to oh. wind up being a conven oh. contested convention, which would have yeah. been... Who knows? I mean, if it would have been fun. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking forward to it. Sure. I, I mean, but if you're looking at a scenario where you know, I mean, delegates were being threatened mm -hmm. to a certain degree. I, I think I mean, had, had had we gone beyond the first ballot, it, it's so unchartered that it would have been very hard and not been predictable. And the more you keep those, uh, whatever it is, uh, 2,500 Republicans on the floor without adult supervision, lots of things could, <laughs> I mean, a lot of things could have happened. And, and our campaign uh, was really premised on getting not to a second ballot, but to a third Fair ballot. Four. Because I think then there would be a lot of, I spent a week at When you say your campaign, you mean John Kasich? Kasich. Because a lot of people are saying, why is he still in this thing? But that's well, well, that's that exactly the reason. And we were at the uh, RNC meeting in uh, Doral a couple of weeks ago, or Hollywood. I, they all look the same. Right. They all have airports with <laughs> Starbucks in them. But, uh, when I was there, what I was struck by was the number of people who said to me, you, you know, we're bound here, but if we get to the second, third, but we could do what we want, and there we are worried about county commissioners and sheriffs mm -hmm. and all, and you would have seen something different. But I, I think he wanted to win the way he won. I think he will try to use the convention as an advertisement, as a infomercial there will be some trying to make him statesmanlike but I think they make a huge mistake if they don't let Trump be Trump let me ask you we only have a couple of minutes yeah. uh, so I want to make this point uh, with, so if he doesn't change his style do you believe his pick is a, uh, for a running mate will go a long way to if he finds the right person to easing some nerves within the Republican Party and voters who like Right there on the Honestly, that's what that's where the focus is right now. That's what Republicans are looking at, who he's going to surround himself with. I think that's a tremendous opportunity for him, and I, I think it would be smart for him to start talking about who he would surround himself with, not necessarily for VP. You want to save that and make a big deal about it, but who you're going to who you're going to pick for AG, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Interior, a, a, any of the cabinet posts. Uh, I think it would be very smart for him to do that, and it is a tremendous opportunity that uh, to have sewn this up before the convention, while the Democrats continue to fight it out. It's a, it's a 
it's a great opportunity for the Republicans to start the general election campaign. Uh, your guy, John Kasich, uh, Donald Trump said this week, you know, I'm very interested in vetting him. My question is, would John Kasich... No. No, you the don't think so? No. no. The answer, whatever the question is, if it's he John Kasich and Vice President in the same sentence, the answer is no. Mm. Uh, but, and I think sometimes we make more than we should have, should about that, who that is. Mm. But I, I think, uh, Michael's right here, I think this time we, they are going to start to look at Trump to say, what... Show us some presidential type mm -hmm. decisions you're going to make. And one of them is uh, exactly what Mike said. Who does he surround himself with? I think uh, it would be very smart early on if he could demonstrate foreign policy chops and particularly national defense mm -hmm. chops and come out with some highly respected group of people who are going to sit around and help him uh, on that. Uh, I think one of the big issues about Donald Trump is, does he know how to form a government? We know he knows how to close a deal. We know he knows how to build a building. Does he know how to form a government? And by that, I mean, who, how do you people it? How do you give it direction? And he's going to have to use this part of the campaign to, I think, demonstrate that. And picking a vice president probably is the first step in that regard. Bold prediction part of the show. We're just about out of time. Is Donald Trump sworn in as the 45th president of the United States next year? I think he will be. I think it will be when all said and done and the choices between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, uh, I, think, I think folks will really decide to vote for change. And Hillary Clinton's been in government for 30 years. I, I can't believe I'm being asked that question. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know the answer. I, I What's your feeling? What's your gut? My feeling is it's a very close situation. The Electoral College shapes up much better for Secretary Clinton than it does for him. But he does have a path, and it runs through the industrial Midwest. And everything and that we right. think we know about this cycle turns out we don't everything, know anything I've been about wrong. It. Everything. Guys, well, it certainly has been interesting so far. Come back any time, because I'm sure there'll be plenty to talk about moving forward. Thanks, Good to Josh. see you. Mike Denny Thanks. and Tom Raff. Thanks, we'll be right back with Democratic candidate for governor, Steve Marsham. Stay with us.